pleasure to welcome you all. I would like to firstly recognise the traditional custodians of the land upon which we stand, and I pay my deepest and ongoing respect for elders past and present. I'd also like to recognise the younger generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who continue to impart their knowledge and help us define who we are as a nation and as a people. I note the apology of Professor Ian Connor, Chancellor and Vice President of Griffiths University. I acknowledge James McKean from the Queensland sector of the Australian Art Society of Australia, known as TASA, and representatives from the local Brisbane Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Jane in particular, and who are in the audience tonight. And I'd also like to acknowledge my own director, Chris Sainz, who's in the front here. It is my very great pleasure to be welcoming you all to tonight for another of our wonderful Perspectives Asia seminars. The se this series is certainly a highlight for us working here in the Asian and Pacific sphere of the gallery, providing opportunities to engage in discussions about the broader social, economic and political currents that inform and influence artists and works that we support, develop and present. This is particularly resonant as we head towards the opening of the eighth Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. I hope you all got your reminders. It's in eight weeks, so we can't wait. And look how relaxed we look. <laughs> so I would like to just say that I strongly believe that the works in this exhibition exhibit a very robust engagement with a number of pressing issues facing our region. And I'm proud to say that the exhibition and its public programs provide many opportunities for building on the types of discussions the Perspectives Asia seminars foster. I encourage you all to attend these alongside our upcoming Perspective Asia seminars, some of which, and I've been asked to name them, on the 5th of November we've got Life as a Weapon, Do Suicide Bombings Really Make Sense? with Professor Riaz Hassan, Director, International Centre for Muslim and Non-Muslim Understanding, University of South Australia, and with an in-conversation with Associate Professor Halim Ran, Islam West Relations and Security Studies at Griffith University. The final Perspectives Asia for this year will be held on the 9th of December and will be on the 4th Australia-Japan Annual Lecture with Mr Shingo Yamagami. He's Ambassador, Policy Planning, International Security Policy and the Deputy Director General, Foreign Policy Bureau. I would like to thank particularly Griffith University, the Director of the Griffith Asia Institute, Professor Russell Trude, and his staff, and in particular, Natasha Verry. Tonight, we have the great fortune to hear from one of Asian art's greatest advocates, Dr. John Wu, in conversation with our very own curatorial manager of Asian and Pacific art, Aaron Sito. Dr. John Yu, AC, is a retired paediatrician and administrator, was born in Nanking, China, and moved to Australia with his parents when he was three years old. See, John, there are things that you might not say in your conversation. That's why I'm reading them out. <laughs> Educated in Sydney, born in 1961, he worked from, sorry, educated in Sydney from 1961, he worked at the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children, now the Children's Hospital in Westmead, becoming head of medicine and serving for 19 years as its chief executive before retiring in 1997. For many years, Dr. Yu has chaired and served on diverse bodies related to children's health, education, medicine and the arts. Chancellor of the University of New South Wales from 2000 to 2005 and Chair of the Australia-China Council from 2000 to 2006. He was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Art Gallery of New South Wales from 1997 to 2006 when he was made a Life Governor of the Gallery and from 2003 was Chair of VisAsia promoting appreciation of Asian visual arts and culture. Tonight, Dr. Yu shares his experiences on how Asian art has been, effect, has been an effective tool to achieve better understanding and build public advocacy in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu and Aaron Sito. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Maud. Um, I guess I'm speaking, sitting, and talking to you, uh, Russell, Chris, Aaron, uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here. Um, when I heard the subsequent uh, symposia that the Institute is uh, promoting, uh, I guess the things I'm talking about might be seen a little bit as trivial or a comic relief. 
But I think art and culture does have a very important part to play in the way we think about other people. A couple of weeks ago, you may have seen the same program on the ABC as I, and it was Sir Michael Parkinson interviewing Lang Lang. And uh, Michael said to Lang Lang, uh, he's talking about his undoubted classical music prowess, and asked him how he got his head around composers like Tchaikovsky, and how, as well as coping with the technical, ability, uh, technical difficulties of Tchaikovsky's music, how he might interpret how Tchaikovsky felt. And Lang Lang talked and said, well, one of the things I always do is to find out everything I can about the composer and where he, well, I should say he or she, might come from. He said that uh, I was interested in learning about Russian history what sort of things Russian liked, and how Russia felt. And I'm saying this because I think that's really important, that if we want to know something about somebody or a group of people, we need to be prepared to try and find out something about them, about their history, especially about what they believe in, their, their beliefs, about their cultural heritage, not just material culture, but a whole lot of other things, like their food. And I guess of all the cultural activities that have really been noticed in Australia is the food of the region, as well as food from other parts of the world. Now, when I was young, which is a long, long time ago, uh, if you went to a country town, then if you were staying in a country pub, then the dining room usually closed at 7, 7.30. And if you arrived after that time, the only place you could get something to eat is either in the Greek milk bar or in the Chinese restaurant. Yes. But I think that started something which has continued, and that is Australians' taste for other people's food. And I'm sure that the fact that so many young Australians, even quite small young Australians, can use chopsticks and in fact choose Asian food has gone some way in helping us think differently about Asians. When you think about it, Australia has changed enormously in the last 50 decades. When I went to school, and I went to a public primary school and a public high school, the school that I went to, which happened to be a selective high school, of about 700 boys, because it was, there was a boys' school and a girls' school. But of the 700 boys, there were two Asians, me and another guy. About four years ago, I went back to my old school to talk at a speech day. And it was really quite extraordinary, because about 60% of them were Asians, and about another 20% of them came from a Middle Eastern background, and the rest were Caucasian Australians. What an extraordinary change that has been. Um, I think sometimes it's something that worries me, because there is a school in Sydney which has the highest marks in the final exams. But that school 
which is purely based on merit, has something like 95% Asians. Um, and whilst I think that's great that Asian kids, and particularly Asian families, value education, I'm not sure that's something we would want to see across the board in our education system. Because not only do Caucasian Australians need to understand other people, but people from other backgrounds also need to understand local Australians. And uh, I think the good thing about Australia is there has been a mix. And by and large, the Asian community has been much more open in mixing with the rest. So that you tend not to get ghetto suburbs. But as the various Asian communities have advanced and progressed, very largely through education, I might say, that they have moved out. And there aren't pockets of Chinese communities. And having said that, of course, there's a Chinatown. And if any of you know Sydney, there's a suburb in the mid-northern suburbs called Chatswood, which when you look at it, it looks like a little Hong Kong, extraordinary high rise, but also in that community are lots and lots of Chinese. But it's Chinese who have been attracted by aspects of Australia and wanted the best things that living in Australia offers them. Now, I think that does present certain problems in that they have money, they can afford the penthouses, the big apartment blocks. And it takes quite a lot for other people to get to know and understand them. I would like to suggest that perhaps the best way for us to understand each other is a way which by and large is non-threatening and non-controversial, and that is looking at the art and culture of other people. Now, this of course brings up the question of difference. How do we cope with difference? A couple of decades ago, I would have talked about acceptance of difference. I think now we've moved on to the stage where we actually shouldn't be noticing difference. When you and I travel, and Australians have a, a very good history of travelling, particularly in our region, do you want to go to Laos and see a culture that's the same as ours? Do you want to see the same paintings? Do you want to see the same textiles? Do you want to see, I was going to say ceramic history, but they don't have much of ceramic history in Laos. But you don't, you want to see something that's different. And why? Because I think most of us value difference. And I think most of us recognize that difference really is very important in everything relating to the human endeavour. I'm fascinated by the fact that we will often change where a highway is to be built because some spotted tree frog has found in the path of this highway. Or we can't build a dam because of some unusual species of water snake or something else. And it's really fascinating, isn't it, that we value variation in nature. We value difference to the extent that we're prepared to pay a high price to sustain and protect that difference. But when we come to difference among Homo sapiens, a lot of us don't really like it. We want everyone else to be the same. 
Well, it's just too bad because we're not the same. Having said that, of course, that the difference between my DNA and your DNA is probably less than 0.5%. So we're essentially the same. But the difference really is important because the difference gives variety and, I suspect in the future, viability. When you walk around university campuses, one of the things that always strikes me is the number of mixed-race relationships you see around. And uh, I like that. I, I find that very reassuring, that young people don't really care about the superficial things of a friend or a potential partner. Because I think in the future, there won't be the need for an old white Australia policy, because Australia is going to have a slightly different hue. And over the next couple of generations, there really is going to be a good mix. And I think art is a very important part of that, because art has helped us to understand that at a time where China was producing most extraordinary porcelain, and I'm talking about particularly the Song period, around about, I'm no good at history, 1960, 1200, something like that. Where were our current great civilizations? What were they doing? And uh, having spent most of my life in Australia, and I was three when I came out, I love English decorative arts. One of my great joys is using Georgian flatware. And I use it all the time. I like Georgian teapots. I used to like Georgian coffee pots, but of course now you don't use coffee pots in the way we used to use them. But in Song times in England, people used treen wood to eat from. Even the most elegant aristocratic homes. I'm not saying treen is bad. I'm just saying in another part of the world, there was the most extraordinary technological advances. Over the last decade or so, we've all been going off to places like Cambodia. And when you look at Angkor Wat, 800, 900 AD, Angkor at that time was a city of about a million people. The population of London at that time, what was it, 140, 150,000. Now, I think we should be very pleased that England continued to develop and grow Whereas Paul on Angkor Wat, a whole civilization was destroyed because water of the greed and the, the lack of sustainability. And I think irrespective of our politics, we can't pretend that life will continue in the way we know it today unless we're prepared to look at what we do and how we do it. Because sustainability is not something that God gave us. Sustainability is something we have to work towards. When I talk about art and how I think it's really important that we should learn about other people and that art is a good way of doing it, I talk about we Australians. And despite the way I look, I see myself very much as an Australian. But we tend to think about Australians looking, learning about other cultures, 
and hopefully embracing the good things about it. What I'm also talking about is looking at the young Asian Australians of the future. And one of the things in the Art Gallery of New South Wales we spent a lot of time doing was trying to engage young people. And it didn't take very long to realise that most young people weren't interested in Chinese art of the Song and the Ming dynasties. They wanted to know about modern art, Western modern art. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how we can bring young families from different heritages of our own to the gallery and show them contemporary art of a different sort. And that's why I think things like your ATP is so exciting. Because you're bringing the best art from the region and showing it to other people. Not saying, look, these young contemporary Asian artists can paint like us. But looking at how they've used a lot of Western techniques, the Western materials, and done something totally different and really exciting with it. And I think if we can help young Chinese, young Asians look at the contemporary art of their country, it will help them to understand a little bit about where that has come from. And I think it's important because there's little doubt that a lot of young people from different heritages feel inferior in some ways. And I think one way to make them feel better about themselves is if they're proud of what their own people do and what their heritage has been like. The first time I really became conscious of being Chinese is when I got interested in Chinese ceramics. And I felt very proud about what had been done. And I wanted to learn more about it. My interest in Chinese ceramics actually started off because I was interested in English ceramics and looking at English transfer wear and, and looking at how they copied certain Chinese patterns and then Chinese techniques. But it meant that I did get involved and interested in Chinese ceramics and through that in Chinese and Asian art generally. Um, I think we ought to be going down an active path of engagement because there's nothing like the protection of feeling good about yourself and feeling good about where you come from. And of course, there's one better way of doing that, is making sure that everybody, as a child, is loved and wanted. Because I've always believed as a paediatrician that you, if you were loved by your family and felt loved and felt wanted, then it really didn't matter what else happened to you because you would have the inner strength to cope with anything that anyone might, might throw at you. Now, OK, I've rambled on a lot, but I hope I've been able to talk to you about how I think art and culture generally can be really very important in how we feel, not only about ourselves, but how we feel about people who are different from us and how we might hopefully feel proud about what we do here in Australia, but what our near neighbours and hopefully our friends have achieved in their own lives. Because undoubtedly, Asia 
will be even more important to us than it is today. And I don't mean just dollars. I actually mean our security and how comfortable we are sitting in the midst of these hundreds of millions of people to our north. Uh, I think the Institute of Professor Trude's unit, I think the work of the art galleries here, and particularly their work with in Indigenous Aboriginal artists and the Asia Pacific Triennale, contribute enormously to that general community feeling of involvement. But learning about people, and hopefully through learning about people, not to be worried about them, not to be scared of them, but to embrace them as, as friends and neighbours. So I think Brisbane, Queensland has done and continues to do a hell of a lot. And I really commend you for that. And I hope you'll continue to do it. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, for your, um, uh, your remarks. I think, uh, I, I firstly, I would like to acknowledge that um, John is such an important figure within um, the community, especially for, for um, Asian Australian people. I mean, before I, I took this position up here in, in Brisbane, I used to run a small non-profit organisation that had been around uh, since the mid-1990s and was specifically about creating these relationships and these links and this understanding between Australia and Asia, but also what, trying to understand this through um, looking within Australia, not just externally, but within it. And my predecessor and uh, the woman who set, helped set the organisation up, Melissa Chu, ha had remarked publicly that when she was setting the organisation up with other artists, that uh, John was such an inspiration because there were so few people of Asian heritage and Asian background who were actively contributing to um, the public sphere. And, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the world has changed, I mean, there has been such a, a shift uh, within our lifetimes in terms of our, our appreciation and our understanding of Asia. I, I'll put it to you, John, that really there's also a lot that hasn't changed. Um, so just the other day, some friends of mine who, who work in the performing arts are still lament that the only jobs that they can get are playing prostitutes or drug addicts or um, they can play in the chorus but not have speaking parts. Um, you know, the art historical accounts within within our museums are still struggling to be reflective of the types of cultural influences that have happened throughout um, our pre-modernity and also um, um, throughout our modernity. And even if we look at our institutions and the, the political s sphere, our politicians aren't really that representative of the types of um, um, cultural diversities that exist within our societies. So I'm just curious, John, if you, what kind of things outside of the arts can, uh, how, how can we help to, to address some of these issues? Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, I, I think you're quite right in the performing arts, but not all the performing arts. I mean, say, if you look at music, for example, uh, there are a lot of Asian musicians. And when you look at the statistics in China, and uh, I don't know how many pianos are built in China each year, five million, and the number of children who are learning to play the piano, over a million, well, one or two of them are going to be quite good. <laughs> and, <laughs> but <laughs> also, when you look at, uh, and I know th um, theatre, is difficult for a lot of people who look differently. But opera is changing. I mean, say that we're quite used to accepting butterflies who are sometimes quite hefty. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, 
I can always remember seeing Leontine Price in New York sing Desdemona. Uh, I think if we really try, well, not if we really try, if producers really try and directors, then I don't think it really matters what somebody looks like if they've got the right voice and they can act. But I think the only thing that's really going to change that uh, is the audience. And the people who start going to th events in the theatre are starting to change. Uh, I, I go to a lot of performances in Sydney. Uh, it really is very clear, clear differences between a music of Eva Chamber Music subscription concert and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra's subscription concert and the opera and the ballet. They're totally different people. And if you go to the Sydney Theatre Company, they're also a totally different people. And you just need to look at them because they dress differently. But I think that's starting to change, though. Um, and I don't think there's any way you can hurry that up. Uh, not even Mr. Hander can get them to change what happens in the opera. <laughs> In fact, the, the, com the conversation with these people really came out of discussion of um, Tony Ayer's current body of work, which is about to you know, hit, hit the TV screens as well. I mean, we're t here we're talking about advo arts advocacy and advocacy through the arts. And uh, this is, the question is probably slightly a little bit off topic, but I'm, I'm curious to understand your position on this. And I wonder whether or not there is something inherently difficult about art and culture that actually makes advocacy necessary? Or do you think that Australia has a particular issue with either cultural diversity or the arts? I think firstly Australia does have a difficulty with the arts and it's seen by so many as elitist and a lot of those people are intimidated by it and I think we've we, the people who are now involved in, in the arts, need to try to change that. Uh, I have to confess, I don't know what you do here, Chris, in, in Brisbane, but one of the things Edmund Capon did in Sydney is he started having late nights on Wednesdays. And on Wednesdays, the gallery opens at five, it's free, at six o'clock, somebody speaks. It might be a comedian, it might be somebody quite serious, like a politician or a, a performer. Uh, then there's a free movie in the big lecture theatre. Sometimes there's jazz playing down in the coffee shop. And the only thing a young person has to do is buy a coffee or buy a glass of wine. And it's packed largely with young people who can't find anything that they can afford. And it starts introducing them to other things. And I think it opens their eyes because their friends and their mates say, oh, come along, I'm going. And they go and they find that it actually is quite fun or quite entertaining. And they come back. And I think we need to do more to make art accessible to young people. Now, when I look around the room, a lot of you are around about my vintage. There's nothing you do about us. You, know, you just forget about us. <laughs> We're not going to change. But I think the young people can be helped to look at things differently. But give them the opportunity. And most of them can't afford it. And if you look at the people who I think we'd all like to target, and that's students. University life is so different to the time I was at university. We used to sit around all day drinking coffee and talking to other people. But now, the poor kids, as soon as their lectures are finished, rush off to try and earn a dollar here and there. 
And yet, universities still think students are able to pay even more and more. And I'm absolutely delighted the Senate stifled the group of eight vice chancellors. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with that, we might, because we did uh, start a little bit late today, so maybe um, uh, we might open up, the, up to the floor for some questions. Russell. Australia, which, with which we in this room are all very familiar, I think, you know, the diversity of it, the difference, the change that's taken place, all those kinds of things. But one of the things that's really frustrating for those of us who believe in the kind of Australia that you're speaking about is that it's not necessarily well understood in Asia, because we still seem to have a serious challenge mm. in trying to convince Asia, countries of Asia, populations of Asia, that in fact we are a different country than the one that they knew in the well before that. Um, and, and that seems to me to be a, a real challenge for not just those of us who are interested in art um, or in politics, but those of us who are interested in Australia engaging effectively with the, the region. So I'm just wondering whether or not you think that's a, a common perception around the region and whether or not you've reflected on how you think we might actually begin to change that. Uh, thank you, Russell. Now, no, I agree with you. Um, if I could use myself as an example again. In 1996, I was named Australian of the Year. And I was really pleased because the local papers had as their headlines, Paediatrician Australian of the Year. But in the region, what was published is Chinese named Australian of the Year. Uh, and it's because it was not expected and that's 20 years ago. I, I guess we've changed a lot in 20 years. They didn't expect that Australia wouldn't take into account the ethnicity of the person they were looking at, even though there were several Indigenous Australians of the year before me. Um, I still think that the main group we need to look at are the young people who still are able to think for themselves and make up their own mind. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is to get Australian families to invite young overseas students to their home. And I've been talking to Rotary Clubs and things like that on how we might do it. Um, and when I say that, I've also included in that group not just overseas students, but Australian kids from regional Australia who are just as isolated in our capital cities as a lot of overseas students. And it's really quite easy, and most universities will help you to do this, is invite two students or three students home for Sunday lunch. Don't invite one, because they'll find it too intimidating. But invite two. And it really is, is interesting how few of those kids have actually had much contact with locals whether the locals are Chinese Australians or Irish Australians. Um, I think we need to put more work into it. I'm saying we recognise that one way of encouraging overseas students is providing more accommodation for them. But what we're not doing is looking at how we can make sure that the overseas students who come to Australia go home as friends of Australia. And that has to be on a very personal level. It's what they experience of, of how people treat them. And uh, I think there, there are a few nicer things 
to bring somebody in from overseas. Now, once again, when I was younger, we didn't have as many young medical graduates. But as a young consultant, I always invited my registrar home for dinner. But of course, it's hard to do today because there's not one registrar now. You know, there might be 30 of them. Uh, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't actually continue to try. And whilst young people are different, they really are extraordinarily attractive people because they think. And they're often open and accepting of something that's different from the experiences they've had up to now. It's not always easy, and a lot of them you'd be pleased when they walk out the door, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's worth trying. And I think it, it, it's good for us, but it'd be really very good for them. Hmm. Any other questions? Mm. on exactly the sort of yeah. scheme that you're talking about. It would seem really interesting if we could make that a two-way yeah. mm. two visitation thing. I, I think, yeah, I, I agree with you, and I think that's a great thing to do. Perhaps it might be easier for the Rotarians to look at Asian students who are here, mm. because for a lot of them to come to Australia, it's a lot of money. And the ones that afford, can afford it are not necessarily the ones or the families that we actually need to make contact with. They can look after themselves. Yes. Uh, doctor, I'd just like to um, agree with what you said about inviting students to your home. My wife and I invite a small group of um, Chinese students from Griffith University home. But we found it's actually a two-way street. The first time we invited them, I put on an Australian barbecue, and they were most respectful of the tastes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They completely mucked everything up, but they were very, very respectful. They then contacted us and said, can we come back, but this time we'll take over your kitchen. <laughs> and we, that evening we learned how to make three different types of dumplings. We just had a great evening. And so it can work, work both yeah. ways, mm. not just... No, I totally agree. I'm see, from a lot of our backgrounds, and I was going to say something that I shouldn't have said. I was about to say from a Christian background, but that's actually quite irrelevant. But it really is much more fun giving. Yes. reading themselves, um, and my interest is in um, introducing more of the writing from Asia, which has its challenges because of translation, and this is um, overcomable, <laughs> if there's such a word, through good literary translation. And uh, I find, um, with the help of the Griffith Asia Institute, the first perspectives, we brought <coughs> three young um, Asian writers to this auditorium uh, about a month ago. And when people um, heard them, um, people are fascinated. You know, they, 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 they found it uh, eye-opening, all these new ideas and attitudes and feistiness. And it's, I agree, it's the exposure perhaps to a range of, of arts, not just the visual arts, not just the performing arts or screen, but also um, that very deep engagement that you get with being in the mind of another person through, through literature. And I hope we can talk about it later. No, well, thank, thank you. Uh, no, I totally agree with you. Um, I'm a bit addicted to whodunits. And, uh, <laughs> and 
I like the ones particularly about ancient Rome. And people like Lindsay Davis, some say that you learn an awful lot about Roman life. Uh, there's a character, and I'm really having a geriatric memory, I can't remember the guy who, who translated him, a Judge D, in a uh, Chinese Judge D, and, and uh, they're quite short stories, but you learn an enormous amount about how Chinese thought back in, in um, early pre-Song dynasties. Uh, we, I don't think, involve other literary heritages very much in Australia. I'm Sam Smith, when I grew up, I knew nothing about American literature. And it's more difficult with a lot of the Asian literature because uh, somebody's got to translate it. But nonetheless, there is a lot that is very valuable in understanding other people. But uh, I, I don't know about, once again, in Brisbane, but there are a group of very active young Filipino writers in Sydney. And quite a lot of their stuff is now being published. And it's fascinating, uh, not only to learn more about how they think, but especially about how they think about us and the way we live. <laughs> the last question. With all the you know, experience you had growing up when you were very young in Australia, you know, two in the one school, two Chinese in the school, what was the defining moment that made you proud to be in Australia? Was there something that said, this is good enough? Um, my mother was born in Australia. Her father came to the gold fields in 1867 and was ordained in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, my mother met my father and went back to Nanking where the seat of government was. And I was born there when the Japanese invaded. So my mother and my sister and I came back to Australia. My father stayed fighting with the Japanese with Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, I came to Australia as a refugee. I came on a passenger liner. I like to call it a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not answering your question, but the reason why I I find it difficult is that I've always seen myself as an Australian. Now, as I became more and more interested in Chinese and Asian art, I became growingly aware of another heritage. And as I learnt more about Chinese civilizations had done. It made me feel very proud that I had that heritage. And I think those of us who might see it as a disadvantage to come from a different background than the Anglo-Celtic background, I actually see it as a great advantage because I can claim two separate heritages. That of the bulk of Australians and that of my own genetic background, and uh, I, I think as long as we feel good and comfortable about both sides, then it's really very valuable. But it was the art, the cultural achievements of China that made me feel really good about being Chinese. Well, with that, thank you, John, for um, the time this evening. Thank you. And also thank you for the, for the questions from the floor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, like you, I think uh, I would like this session to continue for quite a long period yet. 
but unfortunately we have a, uh, a deadline which we have to meet. And may I, as the director of the Institute, and on behalf of the Institute and on behalf of the gallery, um, thank you and John for coming along this evening. Um, John, you began by talking about this exercise as perhaps one of comic relief. And of course, for this audience, and for many, this could hardly be further from the truth in, in so far as I think we are concerned. Because, because what is fundamental, as you recognise in your remarks, the importance of our future in Asia, which of course is a, a future, in part, a future dependent on our prosperity uh, in Asia, as well as, of course, our security. Uh, in Asia. Um, but one of the things that has frustrated me about um, our engagement with Asia, and I've been doing for quite a long period, and, and which you've alluded to, of course, is the, the absolute importance of, of understanding Asia more deeply. And, and that, of course, is what you've been injuncting us to do this evening, to understand Asia through its cultures, um, to understand Asia through its art, um, through its literature, and to engage more deeply, dig deeper, and look at the, accept the transactional nature of our relationship with Asia, of course, um, but if we wish to comprehend what it is we are doing in our future, then we need to go more deeply into that cultural level. And so art as a, as a mechanism for cultural in, in engagement is, seems to me to be a very important theme that you've um, drawn our attention to. And, and one of the things I, I really liked about your remarks is the fact that you bring balance to it. So while you're, um, of course, uh, an Asian Australian, and I'm not sure you necessarily want to embrace that idea, um, but, uh, and, and you obviously understand fundamentally the importance of our engagement, but, but you have a balanced perspective on this. So your, your little anecdote about um, the school in Sydney that has 95% Asian students, for example, um, is, 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 a is a reflection, of course, of what we are today, um, but not necessarily um, all of the virtues of it. So I think you brought to us a balanced perspective on, on this particular issue, uh, not one that, that is, it is one deeply informed by wisdom and experience, um, and one that I think reflects not only the realities of our country, of course, but what we need to be doing to think more uh, about how we engage. Um, and your theme similarly about difference, the acceptance of difference, of course, that's the thing that Australians uh, are learning is owned both domestically, understanding our sense of difference, the differences in our community, the ethnicities that are different in our community, but of course accepting the difference um, in our engagement with Asia and of course um, in accepting that as a kind of ethical virtue which we should be doing. Uh, I think you made the point about the value of variety and then I rather like the point you make about viability <laughs> as um, mm. difference being, and that presumably reflects something of your medical training, that, that um, difference is fundamental to, to the preservation of the species and, and, and of course, and, and you wonderfully got onto that theme of sustainability which is so important. Uh, in, in our own future and of course our own sustainability depends on, on these deeper understandings. And then finally the point you made about um, engaging youth which of course uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to see there are some young people here um, this evening, um, um, younger people of a different um, age but, but, but especially younger people and, and that's terrific uh, to see um, so far as I'm concerned um, but it's such an important theme I think. In, in our future in Asia. And, and, and the question I asked, which is, seems to me such a challenging one for us to confront, is a question about how do we do this over the long term? How do we sustain ourselves in this? And, and of course, you're absolutely right. Doing it through a stronger and deeper engagement with younger people, uh, bringing people to, to art, um, bringing people to a deeper understanding of Asia. Uh, is, is a really important theme, I think, and, and one that I, I, I must say, I, I, we haven't had too many people at our place um, uh, recently um, over the barbecue from Asia, but, but thank you for the idea. I will take this home tonight <laughs> and, and see how that flies. <laughs> um, but, but although I, I do have an Asian daughter, so um, it's, it's something that I think is, is a really important theme that you've, in fact, so many important themes uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think this has been 
uh, a compelling um, occasion, um, a thoroughly engaging one, and not just interesting and compelling, but a really important one uh, in, in terms of our uh, understanding. And it was brought home to me as I listened, I, I, there was not a sound. There was not a sound in the room as we were listening to you. And I think that is perhaps the, the greatest compliment we can pay you, that we were listening so closely to your wisdom. Um, we were most appreciative of the experience you were bringing to the occasion and absolutely delighted that you came to us today and share your thoughts with us. So thank you so much for doing so. Uh, on behalf of the Institute and the Gallery, we're absolutely delighted you can do it and we hope to see you again. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Thank you.